So you just got your first camera and you've heard every photographer saying that you should shoot in manual mode. But you've got no idea what that means or where to start. Don't sweat it. I'm gonna tell you why they all say you should shoot in manual and then I'm gonna show you how. If you just wanna skip straight to the tutorial, that's fine, I've got timestamps below, but I'd say it's important to know why you wanna shoot in manual and when not to. So first off, why should you shoot in manual? Manual mode allows you full control over every setting that goes into creating a perfectly exposed image and gives you complete creative freedom over that image. The benefit of this is you can make artistic choices with your compositions such as underexposing your image, overexposing your image, shutter drag, light painting, and so on. The point of manual mode is to give you, the artist, options that you wouldn't otherwise have in auto mode, which most people with their first camera shoot in all the time. Now, there are certain situations where you may not want to or be able to shoot in manual mode as well. Situations where you may need to snap the moment quick, or it's gone. In these instances, you would determine whether it's more important for you to have complete control over shutter or aperture. Then switch over to shutter priority or aperture priority and shoot from there. What those modes allow you to do is to either pick what shutter speed or aperture that you want for your image, and the camera will take care of the rest of the complex calculations to determine what your appropriate shutter speed or aperture and ISO should be to perfectly expose the image. This can be really helpful in those situations and really take the pressure off, but today we're talking about manual mode, so enough about that. So first up, if you haven't touched manual mode on your camera yet and you switch to it and take a photo, chances are it's either gonna be underexposed or overexposed. So we need to discuss the three main elements that you need to understand to get a properly exposed photo in manual mode. They work together, so if you adjust one, inevitably you're gonna need to adjust one or both of the other two. First up is aperture. Odds are with your first camera, or you received a zoom kit lens that has a variable aperture, meaning the maximum aperture will change the further you zoom in up until a certain value. Think f3.5 to 5.6 or f4 to 7.1, meaning f3.5 will be your maximum aperture at your widest focal length and f5.6 will be your maximum aperture after you zoom in to a certain focal length. Your maximum aperture will have the shallowest depth of field, meaning that less of your image is gonna be sharp and in focus and the rest will be more blurry and softer. It also lets in the most amount of light. At the maximum aperture, the iris of your lens is as wide open as it can go and letting in more light to hit your sensor. A lens with a maximum aperture of f2.8 will let in more light and have more beautiful bokeh in the background. And a lens with an f1.4 maximum aperture will let in even more light and have a creamier, more shallow depth of field. On the flip side, your minimum aperture will let in the least amount of light but have more of your image sharp and in focus. This might be f22 or f32 on some lenses. This is great for landscapes or other situations where you want most, if not all of your image, tack sharp. Shooting with an aperture between f8 and f11 is great for this. So when choosing your aperture, you need to take into account the look you're going for and the amount of available light in the scene. As a general rule of thumb, if you want a really defocused background, go with the widest aperture that your lens will allow. Same goes for if your image is underexposed. Though on some lenses, the widest aperture won't be as sharp as one or two increments above the widest aperture. So keep that in mind too. L and L. I can't remember which one it is on the camera, if it's flipped or what, I can't remember. But L and L, light and look, are the two things you need to remember about aperture. Next up is shutter speed. Shutter speed does exactly what it sounds like, but if you've never used a camera before or don't know much about how they work, Here's a brief explanation. Your camera has a sensor that light hits when it comes in through the lens. This sensor captures all of the light data in frame and converts it into an image. Or if you're shooting raw, like you should be, stores all of that light data on your card and you will need a program like Lightroom that can read that data and let you manipulate all the raw data unlike a JPEG. Your camera also has a shutter which acts like a curtain that opens and closes at different speeds to let in and cut off light from hitting the sensor. This is what we're gonna address now. So like I just mentioned, shutter speed controls the speed at which your shutter opens and closes, and this has multiple effects in your final image. The first being, a slower shutter speed will let in more light, and a faster shutter speed lets in less. So remember earlier when I said these things all work together? Well, if you use a smaller aperture, you're gonna need to make up for that loss of light, and you can do so by slowing your shutter down. Same goes for if you use a wider aperture, you're gonna need to let in less light, so you use a faster shutter speed. If you wanna shoot something really dark like the night sky, well, First of all, you're gonna need a really wide aperture lens, but you also need to use a much slower shutter speed. This way you let in as much light to the sensor as possible. So, multiple effects, right? Well, this not only affects how much light your sensor receives, but also how much motion it captures. If you're shooting a fast moving or erratic subject like an animal, you're gonna to need to use a faster shutter speed to freeze the action. Like if you wanna freeze a bird mid-flight or diving into a lake or something like that, you're gonna to need to use a really high shutter speed to freeze that action. 
like one two thousandth of a second. On the other hand, you can use shutter speed creatively as well for capturing motion. You could set your camera on a tripod and capture a river flowing with a very slow shutter speed, and it will capture all of that motion, making it look really silky smooth and dreamy looking, but keep everything else around it sharp and in focus. This is called long exposure photography bonus bit of knowledge for you. But you have to be careful because if you use the incorrect shutter speed for the subject, your photos could turn out blurry or overexposed or underexposed. Here's a little cheat sheet for you to go off of, but remember it doesn't take into account your other settings at the time of the shot. Before I continue, I just want to say thank you so much for checking out the video this far. I hope you found it useful. If you have, it would really mean a lot to me and really help me out if you just took a second to click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't, well, Carry on. I'm just kidding. I really hope you have found it useful. Be sure to click the little bell icon on, along here somewhere uh, to notify you of all future content. Now, back to the video. The final third key element to shooting in manual is ISO or ISO. ISO controls how sensitive your camera sensor is to light. And it does so by amplifying the signal of the light that hits your sensor digitally. So you can make your image brighter in low light situations like if you're shooting indoors or in the evening or at night. So if your aperture is as wide open as it can go and your shutter speed is as slow as it can go with shooting handheld or whatever your subject may be, but your scene is still underexposed, you can turn up your ISO and it will take that last little bit of the way to being properly exposed. Though you do have to be careful though. Because ISO creates this artificial light digitally, it can introduce what's called noise in your image. I'm sure we've all seen it, it's that grain that appears in the image, especially noticeable in the darker areas. Though most modern mirrorless cameras are much better at handling higher ISOs with minimal noise, it's still best to keep your ISO on the lower end when possible. So. These three key elements make up what's known as the exposure triangle, basically showing the relationship between all three key elements. Your aperture affects your shutter speed and vice versa, your shutter speed affects your ISO and vice versa, and your ISO affects your aperture and vice versa. These three elements work together to create a perfectly exposed photo. In manual mode, you have control over all three, or you can set your ISO to auto and then only have to worry about your shutter speed and aperture. Either way, they all work together and you have to learn to use all three in order to master manual mode. I hope this video helped you out and gave you a clearer understanding of how to use manual mode and the basic things you need to worry about when shooting in manual mode. Leave a comment below with what you found most helpful. As a newbie, there's a lot of mistakes you can make in photography when just starting out, and don't worry, you'll still continue making mistakes down the road when you're further along, but be sure to check out my video here of my top five beginner mistakes and how to avoid them.